Okay, so this is the mental health assessment part um, of your weekly lecture and slides. So it looks like there's only 48. Hopefully we can get done with this pretty fast. I'm going to try to see how fast I can do this in so that we can move on to the next set of slides. So I feel like mental health is very straightforward, but I also feel like that we miss a lot of pieces and parts that make such a big difference in your ability to have an appropriate assessment, an appropriate rapport, and an appropriate relationship with your patient. Um, we should always strive to have a nice state of well-being, which is the definition of mental health um, for our patients, but we should also um, try to anticipate things before they become 100% apparent. Uh, so case in point, I have a patient that's very distant, that doesn't want to really want to talk about things. I'm doing a health history. They've recently been diagnosed with cancer or they've recently lost a spouse or things of that nature. Um, at that point, I'm going to do a very quick uh, mini mental health and well-being assessment. Um, and we're going to get into little things like that when we're related to um, issues such as anxiety, depression, things of that nature, because they are a very big deal. Um, we want to teach people their appropriate coping mechanisms so that they can move on from their current state of what I call flux, right? So we have to be very um, careful. I started to say caring, but I'm like, we're already going to be caring because that's what type of people we are. I, I'm going to say concerned, but concerned is kind of a half attempt at saying that I care, so that isn't appropriate. Um, what I feel we need to do is take the time to get to know this patient. Take the time to walk in their shoes. Take the time to understand their feelings, right? So uh, being empathetic walking in that line and understanding their chosen path based off of their feelings, okay? So, yeah, I think that should be good enough for here to give a good definition and summation of what we're trying to achieve in this lecture. So let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's see, mental status, degree of competence uh, that a person shows from an intellectual, emotional, psychological, and personality level. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Um, so mental status, it's just understanding that the person is at baseline competence. Um, usually we say uh, alert and oriented times four, so alert and oriented to person, place, time, and situation. Uh, so that would be the degree of checking to make sure a person uh, is basically around the board, a, a, an interpretation of a healthy individual um, from a psychosomatic perspective, right? So from the brain, everything is running and all the cylinders are hopping, right? That type of deal. Uh, so can there be variance in this? Absolutely, there could be. A person could be far more um, emotionally intelligent than they are intellectually intelligent, um, and vice versa, right? Someone can have a fantastic personality and um, maybe isn't so good um, with themselves and very mentally stable. Uh, mental stability is a spectrum. Um, and we're going to get into some really, really kind of hard disorders. Um, some of you may be familiar with them. So when we go through um, the mental assessment, portion of the lecture. I just want everyone to come with an open mind, come with an open perspective. A lot of people have a lot of stigmas attached to these disorders or these um, disabilities, depending on you know where they track in the DSM-5, which is where we determine what these dysfunctions look like, right, and how we, how we rate them. So I need for everyone to just, uh, I'm not asking you to come in overly sensitive. I'm just asking you to free your mind of your stereotypes and your microaggressions that you may have. And maybe you'll learn a thing or two as we go along. Because I know that this is a hot spot for a lot of people. I know a lot of people, you know, have friends or family that suffer from mental illness and um, or drug addiction. We're going to go into that as well, or some type of um, abuse that has then 
driven into today's path and their ability to, you know, have a, a stable existence. So this is kind of a tough lecture for a lot of different reasons. And I, I want everyone to just come in trying to understand that we're going to look into the person who is dealing with the disorder and not the disorder that is causing the dysfunction in the person. There's a difference in the two. We always look at it from a very dry and technical data standpoint. I feel like we never look at it from the patient standpoint, right? Because perspectives vary. But as a whole, I want us to focus on how the patient is feeling when they're dealing with this and not so much the disease itself because you guys can read the slides. So let's take it from a different perspective and see if we learn something. Next slide. All right, so interpersonal violence. Abusive experiences may influence a person's mental health. Uh, yeah, may. I would say regardless of the outcome, it's going to be something that is going to influence a person's mental health. So alcohol abuse, drug abuse, or personal abuse, um, I would say that they are going to influence a person's mental health. Back in the day, 70s, 80s, 90s, and um, even most recently, there was a correlative factor um, of people having a pattern of abuse, right? So like if my parents were abusive, then I would be abusive, right? But we never looked at the opposite to the extreme, um, or we didn't until recently. And now that's what I appreciate about uh, what we're doing for mental health is we were very quick to say what bad things were going to happen as a result of um, someone being raised in an abusive situation. We never really looked at the exciting things that were positive things. And I think now um, within the last you know 20 years or so, um, we're now exploring what that looks like and finding out um, some very wonderful things. For instance, there is a correlative factor um, with people who have experienced either within themselves or within their family, uh, personally, an episode of drug abuse, alcohol abuse, or personal abuse um, from either parent, they are more nurturing as an individual um, and usually choose the field of medicine, right? So it doesn't go for everybody, right? But the idea of being able to have a sense of service before self and that idea uh, that would be raised in this type of uh, environment in a home could precipitate a child who is then very overly nurturing um, for the parent who has this type of behavior, right? Again, it doesn't go across the board. But I appreciate the fact that we're not just looking at the disease and its negativity. We're looking at also the positive vibrations that can happen as a result of a very poor experience. And I think this says something, right? I think this says something about how we're going to approach medicine and how we're going to um, evolve um, in how we approach medicine. Because we used to approach medicine 20, 30 years ago as, all right, something's wrong with you because you have a disorder. But you'll find that there are many disorders or mental health conditions um, that have positive vibration as well as potential negative traits that aren't very desirable. Okay, and we'll talk about these as we go along. Because again, this is a very, very sensitive topic. We gotta be very, very careful about how we walk over this. But I don't want us to be so careful that we miss a moment to really understand a concept and really flip our behavior of how we see mental health as individuals. So I know this might be, and you know, I don't like the word triggering, right? Because to me, it means something very different, but I don't want to be this way. I want us to be very accepting of these sorts of topics because the difference between normal and crazy is crazy got caught. Um, and it's just a matter of time before normal gets caught. <laughs> like, that's it. Because <laughs> we're all a little bizarre, and bizarre is quite beautiful. All right? So let's go to the next slide, and let's start talking about the anatomy and physiology of the brain, the limbic system, the mental health process itself. All right, very brief history. Um, when we're dealing with anatomy and physiology, we are dealing with the emotional brain. Uh, versus the 
um, the processing brain, right? So we can look at it as left and right brain since everyone thinks that the right brain is the artistic emotional side and the left brain is the logician who, you know, stores statistical data and pattern inducing things, yada, yada. And, and that's largely in part not an accurate thing, but it was a, a way to create separation and division of these lobes um, as well as their interdependent processing. So I see why they compartmentalize it like they did, but it doesn't exactly work that way. Um, but here's what you need to know. The limbic system is the emotional brain. It regulates memory, emotions, uh, fears, um, anger, uh, attachment to that anger, which is kind of interesting because it's not the level of anger. It's how we are attached to that anger. There's an idea where we sometimes um, as humans like to create anger within ourselves as a positive coping mechanism. It's so bizarre. Um, but I get it. This is what I call the brain is a very, um, the brain is like the part of the web that you don't want to get a hold of because you could really mess some things up if you don't, if you don't watch very closely. Right. So we have the limbic system. We've got the hippocampus. Uh, this is where we store our memories. Uh, amygdala. This has to do with, um, anger, right? Thalamus and hypothalamus, uh, we talk about regulation of a lot of different um, body systems in that point. So yeah, this is our emotional side of our life. And also our insula is a part of this as well. Um, and this is our feelings of uh, how just the world is around us. So if I, um, if I have a high response in my insula, which is uh, temporal parietal area, um, then I would then feel like the world is a very just and fair world versus a lower response um, in that region would mean uh, I know that there is nothing fair about this world, but I just continue to exist within the world, right? And that's when we talk about really, really hard topics like feeling of belonging, you know, uh, how we deal with self-actualization and our psychosomatic perception of that. Big, big, big fat words that don't matter right this second. So just know that there's pieces and parts. The limbic system is the emotional brain versus the, the logic type of brain um, that compartmentalizes things. It just is easier to do it that way. And then we'll look at a diagram of the anatomy in the next slide. So here's a basic diagram. Uh, corpus callosum separates the left and right hemisphere. Uh, we got the thalamus, which is a little bit deeper. Hypothalamus is below that. Uh, hippocampus, this is super important for memory, uh, recall. Um, yeah, that's basically it. So now let's talk about neurotransmitters. All right, neurotransmitters. How can I explain this in a very, very simple, easy way? Uh, so neurotransmitters are like going to a sonic drive through the day that they have their roller skates on. All right, if you guys have ever done that, it's kind of bizarre. So neurotransmitters are kind of like that. Um, think about it. So in order to go to Sonic, they have to place the order up at the window. They're on their roller skates. They are carrying a tray with them. There's a lot of things that are very cumbersome, right? Trays and drinks and shakes and straws and all the other jazz. So basically how it works is they go to the booth and they wait to get their order, right? So neurotransmission is, well, first it goes to the window and says, hey, this is what I want for my order, right? So neurotransmitter goes to the order counter and says, hey, this person in this vehicle wants this shake, right? And then the uh, guy in the back, he processes that information, he creates that um, shake, he then puts it into the window, and then I grab that, uh, that shake, and then I skate over to the vehicle and I hand them their shake. That is, that is transmitting information via a neurotransmitter, if that makes sense any sense because when we synthesize things in the neurons we are conveying the message over within the neurons itself and then we release it in a synaptic cleft aka we release it to our tray so that we can then bind that tray to our hand and send it to the receptor sites aka the person who wanted their shake 
so that they can receive that shake and they can then look over to the vehicle next to them and go, hey, this is pretty good, or hey, this sucks, don't order this kind, all right? So that would be the idea of um, neurons or other neurons or effector cells getting that same transmission. So that's kind of how I want you to look at it, all right? So it's just, it's, it's a shift of information going kind of back and forth and receiving this information, responding to the information, and you do it in just a nanosecond. It happens very fast. Um, so we have what's called reuptake factor in neurotransmission, which is cool because if we have storage, we return it. So if I have the ability to store information and I choose not to, I just return that empty data back to the shelf. I want you to look at the brain as um, a series of books. It's a series of information that I can recall at any given moment. My brain is like a library, at least a, a, a big bit of it is. And in my library, I can grab any book at any moment and turn it to any page and recall that piece by piece. Everyone's brain has that ability. What happens when we age is as we start to get older, we start to go, all right, do I care about this book? No, I could just trash it and toss it. Right. And then in its place, we can put something more important. So that's what I mean by dropping information and returning it to storage, because if it's not important and I have no more saved data and I can't upgrade to a higher data usage or a memory storage, then at that point, I would just start, you know, deleting things that no longer apply. So that's why we lose childhood memories as we get a little bit older. So um, I think I have talked about this as much as I can, so let's go to the next slide and see what we got. All right, so I need for you to understand how the brain works, and I'm going to be quite under, like quite honest. Uh, this is non-negotiable. I need for you to know every single one of these: norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, histamine, acetylcholine, GABA. I need for you to know what all of them mean. I need for you to know what too much of it means, what not enough of it means, what will happen to our patient if they have too much or not enough, and what medications fix it. Now, this is the hardest part of mental health because nobody wants to learn about the brain because there's too many pieces and parts to it. I respect that. As someone who loves neuroscience and neurosurgery, and for someone who has for the last 10 years of my life and probably always will, and as someone who's trying to understand uh, every little nuance about the brain, I still respect the fact that you guys can't stand it because unless you're just in love with it, it's, it's annoying. I get it. This is non-negotiable. I need for you to know what norepinephrine does to the brain, why it's important, what happens if I don't have enough, what happens if I have too much, and what medication do I need to fix the problem. Plain and simple for all of these. There are syndromes if you don't have enough of or too little of. And there are symptoms for toxicity as well. And there's also antidotes to this problem. So I need for you to understand. Because nine times out of ten, when you have a patient who is unruly due to an exacerbation of a mental health issue, whatever that looks like, it's not the person. It's the chemical imbalance. I need for you to understand what that does to a person. A lot of these people know that they have an imbalance and they can't fix it. And they want to. Could you imagine what it's like to live in a world that you don't even feel like you belong in? Could you imagine what that feels like just for a day and for people to tell you that you're crazy and you feel stable and you're successful, very successful, in fact, and people act like something's wrong with you and you don't understand why when you're doing so well and they're not doing so well and they have a poor disposition and you have a great disposition, but something is wrong with you. I want you to think about what that feels like. It makes you feel like you're going crazy. And ironically enough, you're the one being called crazy. So this is what it feels like to have a disservice done to an individual who has a mental disorder or condition or a dysfunction, because there are differences and nuances in that, and to feel like everything is going well. That's when you start to bring yourself down because others are bringing you down. This is pretty not okay. 
So we're going to look into that as well. All right. So non-negotiable, you got to know those things. Next slide. Now, I feel when we get into presynaptic nerve terminals and postsynaptic cells, we get into a realm where that's far too much pathophys for you to be concerned about right now, considering you never took pathophysiology. So for the purposes of this class and for the purposes of this nursing program, I'm going to elect to let this slide go. But what I would encourage you to do is watch a two minute YouTube video and I would call it presynaptic and postsynaptic nerve cells easy. And there should be a two minute video that gives you a two minute synopsis and then move on from this slide. All right, next slide. Okay. So general health history, this is the time where we look at our patient and we determine if we see that they have a healthy personality or maybe a healthy or an unhealthy personality. This is going to have bias. There is going to be bias on either side. Sometimes a patient is perceived to have something wrong with them when there is nothing wrong with them. What is truly quote unquote wrong with them is the perception that the patient has with the nurse. And because of that, they feel like they need to be guarded because the presentation of abrasion isn't on the patient. It's actually on the nurse and the nurse and her hierarchical way of thinking is superior and therefore the patient is inferior and therefore they could do no wrong. You'll see nurses like this. Um, they're usually very, very green or they're usually very, very uh, old not old in age, but old in valor, like they've been doing this for a while, and they're burned out because the world has burned them out, and they're kind of in that state of losing their faith in humanity slowly but surely. And this happens very rarely, um, but it does happen, and you see it. And they're just the bitter, bitter old brigade of nurses that are like, back in my day, right? And not so much anymore. But try to give these guys a little more consideration if you can, because sometimes it's easy to run somebody over when they act a little, a little much. Um, so make sure that when we're doing this mental health assessment, we're understanding that this may be a biased opinion. A lot of times um, people will say when we do change of shift in nursing, you better watch out for this patient because they do this and this and this. I literally out one ear or in one ear out the other, I don't care because nobody's opinion of one person is ever going to be my opinion of that person because of the way I think and the way I understand the world around me supposedly is quote unquote flawed. <laughs> Jokes on you guys because it's kind of a superpower and I see the good in everybody, right? So I see the intention behind the action before I even really see anything else if I'm honest. You know, like eye color, hair color, things of that nature. It's the soul that I'm looking into from the second um, that I walk into the room. So make sure that you understand that this is our interpretation, whoever is documenting that detail. But I don't need for you to take that as gospel because a lot of people have a lot of bias, right? Next slide. All right, so we're going to listen, or we're going to listen, we're going to look at some more common uh, data collection um, and nuances about a patient that would be indicative of someone who um, might be struggling. However, this is not uh, a very good depiction. This is the most basic textbook order of the way patients act, but is mm, seldom a true understanding um, and symptomology uh, of the presentation you will truly see in a clinical setting. Okay, remember, most people um, that get into academia and write the books, they aren't necessarily new bedside nurses that get to the bedside every opportunity they can. Um, so there's a lot that they miss in translation from not having that experience. All right. So are they dressed appropriately for the weather? Okay, does the mood seem appropriate? Um, is the emotional state for the patient appropriate? Again, there's bias in all of this because someone would um, look at someone dressing in baggy clothes and think that they were just trying to be comfortable. And the first thing that I would think of in my brain with my experience and background is, all right, are they trying to hide their body for some reason, right? Because there are um, some people who suffer from some severe 
um, issues resulting from severe trauma. And these people uh, traditionally want to cover their body as much as they can and wear as many layers of clothing that they can uh, because it's harder to hurt somebody when you've got five layers of undershirts and undergarments to get through, if that makes any sense. So we need to be, again, not so overly sensitive that we're smothering a person, but being overly sensitive in the fact that we may not know the true story while we're getting the story. So we need to walk very lightly until we start to get into the deeper waters of understanding what's happening, right? And then we can start paddling a little bit. Does that make sense? All right, so what's the tone of the voice? Um, monotone, please understand a monotone voice does not mean that they're angry or sad, right? Some people carry a monotone voice for a lot of different reasons. There are specific conditions where a person would carry a monotone voice um, because the idea of influxing the voice isn't as important as the words that are coming out of their mouth. That in itself would show and emit a tone uh, but you would have to be able to recognize that. So uh, again, please don't take all of this as gospel because that's not exactly the idea, but know that this is a good start. So while we're learning how to pick apart these little pieces, this is what we do. How's the conversation? Am I talking about one thing and then they go tangential into another direction? Are they trying to project information to me? Right, Because, again, a lot of people, rather than saying this is what they fear in the world because they're um, trying to keep that ego uh, rolled tight into them because they don't want to bruise, they will um, say compensatory things, right? And they will project it towards you um, in an effort to tell their true story to you, if that makes any sense. So let's look at the next slide. Now with mental health medications, a lot of them carry over into cardiac medications or a lot of them carry over into medications for smoking cessation. So for instance, Wellbutrin is used for depression, but it's also used in aiding and binge eating disorder. It's also used as a secondary mechanism for smoking cessation. So, um, you know, there are just medications that are used for many things. Adorax is used for itching uh, in cancer patients or, you know, in regular patients who have eczema. But it's also used for anxiety because um, there's a histamine factor that goes along with it that makes you a little bit on the more relaxed and sleepier side. So sometimes I'll use it for anxiety, not otherwise specified. So just make sure that we understand what medications are you taking. And as we look at these medications keep into consideration that the clonopin might be used for their blood pressure management or it's used because of another reason. Maybe they have um, antisocial personality disorder or maybe they have agoraphobia, right? And that is a way of uh, taking out that anxiolytic trigger, that type of a deal. Next slide. Uh, past medical health history, asking the questions, I'll just let you read those. Um, I feel like these are pretty, these are pretty good start to questions and, and how we're going to delve into uh, what a person is truly going through and how that's going to affect and shape their health care in that setting. Uh, so let's just jump to the next slide because you guys can look at that. Again, um, these are self-concept questions. How have you been feeling about yourself? I feel like Although that is a wide open question, I feel like how have you been feeling about yourself could have 15 different f factors into play. Maybe this is just the way I overthink, but how have you been feeling about yourself in terms of what? In terms of my success, in terms of my personal dynamic, in terms of how I'm happy and fulfilled within myself, in terms of you know my experience with stress? Like, w w hi, w what do you mean by that? Can we elaborate and, and dig into it a little bit more? But I think that this is a good starting point so that we can ask those questions maybe and that we can um, get them to hone into whatever it is that we're trying to get them to talk about. Um, but again, this is our basic starting point. So just look at the questions, understand them, um, and then move on to the next slide. Again, this is, these are a beginning 
um, and a good, a good way of uh, starting to understand how this works. This is most important to me. Do you feel safe? Do you feel safe? I feel like this is one of the most important questions we can ask. If we get a patient that uh, has Alzheimer's, dementia, or a history, a lot of times we get these patients, they're found wondering. Um, the first thing that we want to let them know when we get them is that they are safe. So I feel like do you feel safe is more important than are the people you feel you can talk to, are there people who you feel like you can talk to about your feelings? How satisfied are you with your interpersonal relationships? I feel like we're taking a survey at this point, but do you feel safe? I feel like you actually care if you ask that versus the other stuff, right? So again, it's all about the wording. It's all about how we approach that patient, right? We could say, do you feel safe 15 different ways, and they mean 15 different things. So as long as we're understanding our actions and our projections and we're um, appropriating those accordingly, we should be okay. Next slide. All right. Stressors. When we talk about stressors, there are a lot of different stressors in this world. Are they true stressors? It doesn't matter. It is to them. It is to them. We, lure, we live in a world where there are significant problems, yes, but... We also don't live in a third world, right? So everyone always jokes about first world problems. And some people can be a little bit angry about that because they come from a third world perspective. So the first world perspective is a little, a little more ego-based, right? So their understanding of problems and their understanding of coping mechanisms might be very different. Um, also, a lot of people who have dealt with a lot of trauma don't feel that the daily stressors of life are truly stressors. So again, interpretation of stressors is important, um, but also understanding anger and coping mechanisms as well is very important in determining the stability of a patient. So let's go to the next slide. All right, anger. Have you been feeling angry? Oh, boy. I don't know that I would necessarily ask that question. Um, but I guess mm, there's a better way to do that. There's just a better way. How do you react when you're angry? I like that one. I do. Do you act verbally? Do you act physically? Do you keep it balled up inside? Okay. Um, can you talk about what causes your anger? That's important because that lets people know how much they open up. But again, this is only a biased opinion because if that person doesn't mesh well with that nurse, even if your perception is we have a great relationship, theirs might be this is not working, I don't like this person, they're not going to be as opened up to you and you might perceive them as closed off. So again, you can't take what you see at face value. You just truly can't. But these are good starts to us understanding the patient and their level of anger and if they have that problem with anger. Next slide. All right, I'm going to go ahead and get on my platform about this because this one is another pet peeve of mine. This is just a huge deal, all right? Alcohol and drug use. I get really angry when I talk about people um, about alcohol and drug use and then people chime in with their personal opinions as a nurse of what they think of an alcohol or drug abuser. And again, my opinion is just only my opinion. It's not your opinion. You may not agree with it. You may. But please, I want you to challenge yourself to listen to my perspective on my end of how this looks. And if you're still dead set on your thoughts and opinions, cool. Thank you for listening to what I have to say. Because here's what I've learned. People don't inherently want to be alcoholics. People don't inherently want to be drug users. They didn't come out of the womb and go, hey, guess what? I'd like to smoke some meth today. I think that's a great idea. No. Something very unstable happened in their existence, and they used alcohol and or drugs as a method or modality of escapism. Something happened to them. You don't just drink alcohol. You don't just smoke a bunch of drugs or inhale a bunch of drugs or put it through your veins because you're bored. You don't. And if you do, then there's still something going on. So try to understand these people. So rather than saying, now again, alcohol use, this is very important when we're doing CWA scales, right? 
super important because I need to know if I'm about to have a patient that's gonna seize out. So I need to pay attention to them very heavily for the first three days after they haven't had a drink. But I need to figure out how much they've had to drink. I need to consider that with their weight. I also need to consider if it's beer, liquor, wine, what the proof is on it, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of pieces and parts together before I start doing the CEWA assessment. But when I say how often do you drink alcohol, including beer, wine, or liquor, well, that's a great question. It is a very um, hmm, judgmental question, okay? So before I even start with this question, if I have a chance to ask maybe something more important before I ask that question because I have the time to do it and still have a stable patient, I would go, what brought you in here? Well, I had too much to drink. Okay, well, what does that mean to you? And they'll just look at me like, what? I'll go, well, what does that mean to you? Because I don't know if your idea of too much to drink is my idea of too much to drink. What makes you feel that way that you want to drink? Why do you drink? Right? Because when you go into the, the head and when you go into the mental process of a person and you ask those questions before you ask how much have you had, what have you had, tell me what you've done, that type of deal, you open up the value of them as a person because they are valuable. And they're actually some of the smartest people I've ever met because um, they're some of the greatest medical professionals that I've met too were um, ex-drug and alcoholic users or recovering drug and alcoholic users, however you prefer to, to say that. It's the same, um, although the nuances are a little different. Those guys are the ones that know what it feels like to come off of something, so they know what to do to help you. Those guys know what you're struggling with on the inside or know a derivative of that struggle because, trust me, if you're going to do something like that and commit to it to the point of alcoholism or drug addiction, um, there is something seriously going on within you on the inside that is a dysregulation of what you feel is normal. Otherwise, you would not try to escape, period. So don't judge these people. It's not for you to judge them. It's for you to help them in their walk and journey through life because they're not well. And it's your job to at least walk them into a path of health and well-being, even if it means that they might not necessarily get it that second. As long as you put them in the path and you hold their hand and you let it go and say, okay, buddy, you do the best you can do, you still got work to do. Don't just, don't just throw your nose up to these people. It's not fair to them. They need the most help, right? Sometimes they need just as much help as a gunshot victim, right? Because one's dying on the inside, one's dying on the outside, but they're still dying. So we have to take these things into consideration and not downplay it or not get mad with it. All right, next slide. All right, problem-based history. Again, these are dysregulations um, in mental health, depression, anxiety, altered mental status. I'm gonna go ahead and say another one of these things. <sighs> depression, anxiety, and altered mental status, at some point we've all had this, okay? It's all, at some point, all of us have experienced a derivative of this. Altered mental status, anxiety, and depression. When I am in a state of depression or I'm in a state of anxiety, then I have altered mental status because I'm not thinking rationally. Duh. Right? You ever notice when you are stressed out or you're depressed or you have high anxiety about something, you forget where your keys are? You forget where your license is and your wallet? You forget where the important things are? But the dumb stuff you remember. Why? Why? Because it's a, dis it's a dysregulation in the chemical receptors that are triggering your sympathetic nervous system response and shutting off that parasympathetic response, which also holds on to the basis of remote memory, right? Which is why we lose those memories of where our keys are, where those important items are. So keep that in mind. All right, next slide. Okay, so problem-based history and depression assessment. Keep in mind that females are at risk for depression two to one over men, 
Now, this is the part where most men would make a joke and go, ha, 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 because the women, you know, and their hormones. Well, you know, and their hormones, that's an appropriate action. So when a person has to have menses every month until, you know, they're nearly 50, that will put them into a state of flux, right? Uh, truly, a person is regulated um, and usually does well enough, but there is an emotional roller coaster based off of a hormone dump uh, within females. We also have a lot of environmental things that we have to be concerned with, kids uh, supporting our own um, integrity as an individual, uh, societal norms come into play as well and expectations. So that makes sense to me because I feel that women have to work a little bit harder at a lot more things necessarily based off of tradition and ideals. Uh, than men do. And I would love to hear a man's opinion on that if there is a solid argument for it because I would totally buy into it if, if someone could give me that formed opinion and tell me what that looks like because I'm quite curious. Uh, but again, and most common between ages of 25 and 44, again, I think about things like expectation of what we're supposed to look like, right? Ageism is a big, a big problem too because as we age as, as women, somehow we lose a piece of our identity because um, our, our zest for being important in a workforce all of a sudden um, isn't as strong. However, as men increase in age, their value rises. So there are a lot of different factors that come into play. And I'm not even getting into religious or, or highly culturally sensitive topics either that um, break this apart and, and dig even deeper. So keep all these things in contact, uh, or in contact, keeping them into consideration is what I meant. Uh, I was reading the word eye contact and body language and tone of voice because we do need to take special attention to those pieces and parts as well. So let's go to the next slide and then talk about depression questions that we're going to ask. So these are standard depression scale questions that we would ask. Um, if you are truly depressed to the point to where you don't want to even talk about it, you're going to know what they're trying to go for and you're going to answer in incorrectly. Uh, do people answer these appropriately so that they don't have to be hospitalized? You bet you they do. Some of these people know the scale, the Siwa scale, uh, the cow scale. They have them memorized so they know how to um, have them graded based off of the symptoms. Um, so they know what that means as far as their medical management. Some of these guys are really smart because the dysregulation that they've had in their life and their dysfunction that they had in their life is so severe um, that they have learned how to, again, medicate and escape. So we have to not be so daggone judgy about it because unless you've done a day in their shoes, you got no reason to talk. You just don't. So try to understand what it's like to be in their world. Talk to them about it. And they will, they will cling to you, and they will start being receptive to actual help rather than being resistant. Just think about it. And look at these questions, and let's go to the next slide. Again, here's a, another set of questions. Uh, do you have friends that you can trust who are available when you need them? Again, uh, some people think that they have friends that they can trust that really, truly only are set out to hurt them, and then there are good people there. So I would ask them a little bit farther in there, are these dependable friends who have you know, supported you? And they'll give me a variance between, yeah, they absolutely support me, they're always there even though when they shouldn't be, or they'll say something along the lines of, well, you know, they steal money from me, but they try their best, and then I can kind of gauge what type of friends we're dealing with. Do I need to worry about these people coming into my hospital and starting a ruckus, right? Like these are things that I'm thinking as we're going along. And then just look over the other questions and then I'll show you some questions related to anxiety. Again, uh, related to anxiety, I like these questions. Do you have to urinate more? Does your heart race, right? Um, have you been more irritable? Are your muscles tense? Do you have a tightening in your throat? Yeah, these are great questions related to um, the diagnosis of anxiety. 
So look at these and see how they are slightly different than the ones related to depression. Um, and then let's dig in a little bit deeper. Next slide. All right, again, we're talking about long-term memory, um, short-term memory. We can talk about orientation of person, place, time, and situation, attention span, things of that nature. So let's go to the next slide. All right, let me talk about altered mental status questions. What year is it? Where are you? So these are not my favorite questions. Um, also, name and date of birth, not my favorite question. Here's why. I know people who are, are literally on their deathbed, and uh, they are within hours of passing. And if they are still speaking, they can still recall their name and date of birth. For the most part, there are exceptions to the rule, but as a general consensus, I've seen, hmm, I'd say 80% of my patients who were within a week of passing could still tell me their name and date of birth up until the final hours because that's something that's so far into your long-term processing. It's part of your identity as a whole um, that you don't really forget it unless there is you know, a chemical deficiency, a massive stroke, something of that nature that has caused um, trauma to the brain or dysregulation of that area of the brain that cannot have any memory recall. But that's why name and date of birth is, I don't feel like a good uh, predictor for true mental status. So I do things like, uh, if I were to come to your front door with a bag in my hand dressed as a witch, what month would it be? That's executive processing. You have to know the traditions of trick-or-treating and know that that's in October. That is a good uh, orientation question for me because I can orient and appropriate a date and a situation to an event. Um, I feel like that's better when we're doing a heavier exam. But uh, if you get a brand new patient in there and you go, hey, do you know where you are? They'll go, yeah, I'm in a hospital. And then you further go, well, what city are you in? That's also a good orientation question. Um, again, memory or executive function and orientation could all be added into that one little question about Halloween if you wanted to. Um, or you can do serial editions. Can you give me every odd number starting with three? Right, three, five, seven, nine, eleven, da 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 da. All right, cool. Uh, next slide. And again, these are some other um, understanding and questions related to abstract concepts, judgment and reasoning, communication, things of that nature. So you can look those over. We'll go to the next slide. Now, in here at the bottom, um, has your drinking caused any problems, risk of harm, relationship trouble, role failure? These these are all nursing diagnosis based off of uh, the answer to this question, can potentiate those nursing diagnoses. Um, how many or many people drink do you sometimes? If yes, how many in the past year? I, uh, I feel like we just need to ask this question how much in the past month, because that's gonna give us a better predictor for that. And here's why, if someone goes, if someone's a, like a crash course full on alcoholic, and I ask them how much have they drink in a year, I mean, come on. This is a daily event. So how about tell me in the last month what that looks like and then ask me how many years have I been doing that? Does that make sense? That would just be the way I, I, I travel through that area. So that way I get a bigger picture of what that looks like. Next slide. I like how we start this off with some people use or have used recreational drugs as a form of, all right guys, this is general question. It's not gonna be anything I haven't heard before. You know, have you used recreational drugs in the past? Uh, do we truly get the true answers on this? Sometimes. Do people still lie about it? Yeah. Is it that big of a deal? Not really. Not at this point. Not unless they've taken something and they're um, overdosed on it. But we're going to do a type and screen, or not a type and screen, we're going to do um, a drugs discovery using a 10 panel or even a 13 panel. So I'm going to know what drugs are in your system if I'm suspicious of this at all, right? This is why we ask for urine as soon as a person comes in so we can start to try to figure out what's going on the second they step into the building. Next slide. And again, when we talk about interpersonal violence, we need to be asking these questions and following up with um, larger questions to get more in-depth answers to see if this is something that we can uh, start to fix as we're in the hospital to provide resources to provide safe haven or if this is something that needs to be seen on an outpatient basis or uh, what intervention needs done if any nobody deserves to be afraid in their home boy is that ever true um, 
These questions are hmm, pretty sensitive questions. Uh, if you were a brand new nurse, you would have a hard time asking these questions and asking it in a way that is going to feel approachable. So I would probably stay away from these questions if I can. Do you have guns in your home is a pretty basic question that's asked. Uh, so I wouldn't feel too intimidated by that because other people have probably heard that before. Um, has your partner ever threatened or abused your children? I think at that point we're stepping into some very uncommon ground that we might not get good answers on um, or appropriate answers if we haven't been trained in mental health specifically. Um, so I would probably leave that to um, a mental health provider or a mental health nurse specifically. So take that into consideration. Next slide. Now, when we're dealing with infants, children, and adolescents, we have to talk to the parents a uh, little different type of way. So read over these, understand those pieces and parts of it. I don't believe this is going to be a part of your examination, uh, but it may pop up because I haven't quite finished that material yet. I'm still working on it. Um, so read the slide, understand it, and let's move on to the next one. When we're dealing with older or when we're dealing with older adults, please understand that manifestations are of aging do include all of these pieces. Um, I need for you to know those pieces and I need for you to understand in your brain why those pieces make sense to you. Um, like problems concentrating or sleeping. Again, it's the theory of dysregulation of your brain because it's aging, which means um, things are going to be lost and the in the the realm of your conceptualization and some of that might be lacking in sleeping because you just can't get relaxed enough um, for your brain to process like it needs to to equip you with that um, particular skating rhythm next slide again these ideas of major depression um, or these psychotic disorders <laughs> When you say psychotic disorder and major depression, and you say major depression has an abnormal mood state characterized by a sense of sadness, define sense of sadness, define hopelessness, define helplessness, define worthlessness, right? Like we're, we're, we're touching into some area where worthlessness means one thing to me, and I'm sure it means a different thing to you. So it's about self-conceptualization, self-actualization, perceptions. It's all about them which is why we don't need to bring us into them, right? Because if their understanding of hopelessness means in your brain through their definition and their understanding of it, if it means that there is a sense of urgency for this person versus, well, that's not my definition of hopelessness, so I wouldn't perceive them to be majorly depressed. Well, remember, you might be a fighter. They might not. In order for them to learn how to be a fighter, they need to see what a fighter looks like. And most people who are severely depressed have been in a position where they haven't really necessarily seen a lot of solid individuals, right? Which is why they've been brought down to the point of major depression, or one of the many reasons why. It's hard to say. So until you live in their existence in their life and try to conceptualize what it is that they are perceiving within themselves through appropriating their feelings and nuances into your own conceptualization and framework, you're not gonna get anywhere. <laughs> so basically, try to show empathy. Physically, walk in their shoes, paint a cartoon in your head of what their day is like, make the pieces and parts real, make them manifest in your understanding. Next slide. And again, when we're talking about major depression, uh, these might also be clinical manifestations, so please keep those into consideration so that you understand what major depression looks like from uh, the perspective of the DSM-5. And let's go to the next slide. Now, as I record this slide, specifically bipolar disorder, this is where we get into a realm of social acceptance no longer socially accepting. So what I mean by that is when we were talking about psychotic disorders, uh, specifically major depressive disorder, a lot of people have had bouts of major depression and understand a person who would have major depressive disorder. Maybe not 100% understand from the inside, 
but they will understand what that is about because at some point there's been a tragic death in their family or there's been you know a significant amount of trauma back to back to back so as a result of that major depression sometimes ensues i know i've experienced that before my whole family died of covid you know in 368 days right you hear that and you go I, well, I can only imagine what you guys would feel if you heard that, you know, with me being Asperger's or whatever you want to call it, spectrum. It doesn't bother me to say those things, but to try to remember what it is to be a human from your perspective, it, it would be very um, shocking to hear that I would imagine, right? Like you get a little shook. So it's acceptable at that point because oh god i would feel that way too all right cool you got that but when we get to bipolar disorder and then schizophrenia and all of these other things it's like we go into a realm of padded walls and straight jackets and guys that's not the deal i'm here to tell you friends that's not the deal first off these disorders are quite common right as common as redheads <laughs> second off um there's a spectrum with these. We're finding that bipolar disorder isn't just bipolar disorder, it's a spectrum, much like autism spectrum, right? I'm what you call, quote unquote, under the radar, right? Even though I'm not really, you can clearly tell something is, whoa, that's different. However, um, I'm very successful and I'm very intelligent and I'm very empathetic even though I might not be necessarily sympathetic or I might not equate that in my body language because I've studied the human condition for so long so that I can communicate with you and, and, and learn from you and teach you as I learn from you. If I can't do that, then why am I here? What's, what's the big deal, right? What's my big mission in this world? So I've really dedicated my life to being able to approach and speak to neurotypical people, right? So I'm the exception, but there is a spectrum. So bipolar disorder might be a quick episode of uh, mania or a little bit of depression that predicates the mania, right? But it might not be such a big deal as to where you can't just walk over it and totally forget it, that it even exists or even notice necessarily that it's there in people. We've also learned with bipolar that it's not a lifelong condition necessarily. Studies from Harvard have shown us that if we are between the ages of 18 and 25, for whatever reason, I would, I would guess because this is the crucial part of frontal lobe development, which finally defines who you are as an individual, right? Um, so during this time, we can mold and make that brain function malleable, which means I can correct the bipolar disorder by the age of 30, they would quote unquote outgrow it. Because at that point, it no longer is technically a psychotic disorder, it is a behavioral conditional disorder. Ooh, that's interesting, right? So the things that we are learning are when you hear scary words like patient with a history of bipolar, as a nurse, you are gonna go, oh my God, this person's going to be bouncy. This person's energy is going to be like whiplash constantly. They're going to be changing their, they're going to be going from crying to laughing to acting like, you know, we need to maybe get some padded rooms involved type of a deal. And they do it in a paragraph, right? Like that idea of what the DSM-5 said is not what we're finding to be true reality. Okay, because remember, this is a neurological situation. We know about 5% of what we should know about the brain, kind of like we know about 5% of the ocean and the ocean life of all of the potential 100%, because they just go into depths that we are trying to conceptualize, but can't even wrap our brain around the idea of a 5D existence and we're coming toward a wall where we don't quite know what that looks like, but we can't quite disprove it either. So at some point we have to figure out how to make it work and accept it. So that's kind of where we're at in the universe right this moment. And it's kind of a great thing and you're a part of it. Digressing to my fair points. When we hear bipolar and we hear, oh no, scary in our head. This is the moment where we need to do what's called counter correction. 
that is when I come in contact with a thought process that I know isn't valid and I know is somehow been uh, given to me as a microaggression by something environmental, whatever that looks like. Maybe you had an experience or an aunt that had bipolar. Maybe you've seen a bipolar patient go off in a hospital setting and you didn't know what to do. Whatever that experience looks like, somebody understands what that means to them and some people know that they might have a stigma involved with it. I need for you to be honest with yourself and go, okay, I have a stigma with this. This is a problem. What am I doing wrong is the next question. And by wrong, I don't mean anything you're doing wrong. What am I thinking incorrectly about this individual in front of me? And at that point, I need for you to shut down your brain. I need for you to temporarily forget what bipolar means to you, what we know about bipolar, what I've just told you about our new findings, and I need for you to just shut it into a void. And I need for you to focus on your patient. Give them 30 seconds of your time and say nothing. Just observe them. Is their body language jarring? Probably not. Is their demeanor aggressive? Probably not. Because much like a snake or much like uh, lizards or much like toads or much like spiders, um, these are things that people are naturally afraid of for whatever reason, but when you look at them, they're quite beautiful. Their skin is a little rougher, but they are gorgeous. They are beautiful. They have texture and color and taste and depth and breadth and experience and knowledge. Okay. Give them 30 seconds of your time and watch and forget what you knew about bipolar and schizophrenia and borderline personality. Because all of these things I'm about to start talking about are all gonna come with these thoughts or these fears or these stigmas. And if we're gonna stop all of these isms that we all say we hate and we're gonna stop and we'll do anything to stop it, we need to start with things like this, okay? Because this goes far deeper than the color of an individual skin. This goes to the core of their soul. And if we can't fix this, how are we going to fix something as superficial as skin color? Think about that. We're going in the wrong direction if we're going to fix this. How we fix this is we give people our time and attention and we mean it. Because the person you are on the inside is so much more, so much more than what you are from another person's angle. Think about all the things that you tell people. All right. Now think about all the things that you've never told anybody and would never tell them because you're so afraid that if they think that they know the way you think, they might perceive you as crazy. Ooh, that got interesting because I know I'm not the only one in this world. I'm here to tell you and preach. Everybody has it. Everybody's got a skeleton. Everybody's got a dirty little secret. Okay. These are the nuances that make us who we are to the core of our being and make and create our decisions and our understanding of our environment around us. Also, the exquisite memories that you're only going to share with a couple of people because they're the only ones worthy. Same concept. There's so many layers to you. This is what we need to fix. All right. I think I've said my tangent about how I feel about the following disorders we're going to go over because we're going to go over bipolar, schizophrenia. Um, we're going to potentially go into borderline personality, which is kind of a hairy topic because everyone understands that is the worst condition a person can have mentally, right? For a lot of reasons that is unescapable and can't, you can't get away from it. It's always going to be there type of a deal. Well, guess what? We're finding new things on that as, as well. So, in the idea of bipolar, a person has a manic phase. They have emotional displays that are not rational. They're not normal. I don't mean emotional displays like over ridiculously hysterically screaming because that's another problem. I'm talking they are eerily happy all of the time. And everything is just the greatest in the whole world. And the tastes and the textures are the, the richest that they've ever been. And this goes on for a long time. 
This goes on for days. And then they have periods where they're so elated they can't physically sleep. So they don't sleep for two days at a time, three days at a time. And when I say they don't sleep, I mean they literally don't sleep. I know this because I've seen it. I've seen it firsthand for a long time. And it's the wildest thing if you've ever been raised around it and to have never have seen it before until you were like in your teens and to just watch it in free form when that's your first adaptation of the Western world as you understand it in your brain. Whoa, it's a lot. It's a lot to watch. But it's, it's done so cleverly that you don't see the transition. You just think, wow, this person's so happy that they're just awake all the time. And that's amazing, right? And then usually comes the crash after that, which is where they have a very long period of severe depression, where they can't physically get out of bed. And sometimes they get you involved. So sometimes they will, especially with children, they will uh, take the child and form a bond with them that is a very toxic and un unhealthy bond that would include them um, starting to support and help. Like, hey, could you get me food? Hey, could you bring me this to the couch? Right? And then slowly that turns into, I'm going to miss you today. Why don't you just not go to school? You don't need to go to school. Right? And then that turns into 42 days of missing one school year. And, you know, basically failing high school, even though they have potential to be something great, right? Like this is the type of thing that happens. But again, this is a heavy end of the spectrum. This is a far right perspective of yikes. Remember, this is a spectrum. So with bipolar, it could be as light as someone is just really fired up a lot and then they get down a little bit. And maybe, maybe it's so down that they just don't want to deal with people, right? That clinically defines it as well to a level. So keep that in mind. And we're going to move on to schizophrenia now. Um, so yeah, sorry this slide took 12 minutes. I just, I'm trying to introduce this concept because this is a stigma we have that needs to stop. Right? The difference between normal and crazy is crazy got caught. That's it. The difference between a criminal and someone who is a model citizen of the world is because they didn't get caught when they should have gotten caught. So when you see criminals, I need for you to look at criminals as, oh yeah, I remember that time where I did blank and I didn't get caught and they did. That sucks, right? I'm not talking about the big stuff. I'm talking about the little stuff and you know what I'm talking about. Everyone's got something. Everyone's got a dirty little secret. The difference between those guys and us is we didn't get caught. And that's literally it. <laughs> so let's treat them with a little more respect and stop with the stigmas because it's stupid. And it makes people angry and creates all of these microcosms and ideas of hate and hatred and the different modalities with which we will create hatred within a species of individuals that are literally co-created by the same DNA if you go back far enough. You are my family, just like any, anybody else that is by blood my family, because we all carry the same strands. <laughs> all right, next slide. So here's the big baddie of schizophrenia that everyone's terrified about. But let's go over it because it's about to get deep. I want you to go ahead and just hike up your pants because the flood's coming. All right, emotions are going to arise and I'm going to have a lot of fun doing it. Because I try to teach people that we're not that different after all. Like we are uniquely made, sure. And we are uniquely made by our unique creator, whatever that looks like. But what if we lived in a world where we understood that maybe severe psychotic disorders are nothing more than, than fog in the background, right? Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, that type of a deal. What if they 
were, again, a spectrum, a wavelength of light, if you will, that bounces from high frequency to low frequency. All right. I'm getting weird on you, but just go with it. What if I told you that we are so incredibly alike that, again, with referencing criminals and model citizens, the only difference is one got caught and one didn't, right? So let's talk about schizophrenia, the big baddie that no one wants to deal with. Everyone has seen the occasional person screaming at themselves in the corner in a weird area um, that is new to them when they're out traveling and they get into an area of the inner city. Maybe they don't have enough medication. Maybe they're taking drugs to mask what medication they need. Maybe they have nothing at all. Who knows? But the display that you see is one that is reminiscent of, I'm not going over there, right? That's what we know of schizophrenia and very little more, unless you've studied it. So what, what is schizophrenia from a uh, factorial point? So severe disturbance of thought and associative looseness. All right. Severe disturbance of thought and associative looseness. Has anyone ever had a severe disturbance of thought related to something that really, really upset them? Somebody said something that was so remarkably sexist or racist or classist to you that you physically saw yourself in your brain paint your cartoon of you doing something so god awful that it need not mention because I know you have you know why because I have and I'm willing to admit it and well we know I don't have a filter which means I'm pretty good at gauging the human condition because I've studied it my entire life in the first person my background in education is in it I teach it right? This is what I do. This is my gift to the world. I know humans. I'm trying to understand how to communicate with you guys better, but I have studied you guys. I got you guys down pat for sure. I'm trying to live in your world. So severe disturbance of thought and associative looseness. Uh, bingo, bango, bongo. You've done it. All right. Impaired reality testing. Hallucinations or delusions. Mm. I ain't never had a hallucination before. Okay, friends, here we go. Let's play a game. I love these games. These are my favorite games. Thank you, Athena. Athena wants to play a game too. So the game is called Who's Your Creator? And how do you celebrate them? Because I don't care if your creator is Ra or Allah or God or Krishna or Vishnu or Shiva, or Allah, um, or anyone else in between that I'm forgetting, uh, K2, right? I can go on for a while. I haven't even mentioned my people. So there's all of that, the Thunderbird, right? Imagine when you celebrate the idea of your creator, however that looks, you do it in ceremonial form, much like we do. And you have a moment of the anointing where you and your creator connect on a spiritual level. And what happens? You feel like you are with them physically, right? You're celebrating them. You hear them speak to you sometimes, hallucinations. You talk to them and you feel them talking back to you when they give you signs and confirmation of your good efforts and of their pride to you and toward you, right? The God confirmations that I've seen, I've seen it written in the stars confirmations that we all hope for. Uh, yeah, hallucinations, delusions. Because if you don't believe in this idea because there are some people that don't for whatever reason. If you don't believe in this idea and you just happen to be a therapist or a psychiatrist, then guess what you've just done? You've just created a DSM-5 diagnosis code of schizophrenia with paranoid delusion. Good job. You and 500 other people that you celebrate with on whatever day you celebrate on, at whatever institution you celebrate in, 
all have the same diagnosis code, theoretically. We're not that different, guys. We're not. We're not that different. I've had that moment. You've had that moment. That's how this works. It means you're doing a good job. It means you're celebrating your creator correctly. It doesn't mean you have paranoid schizophrenia. Okay? So what really separates the man from the mystery? What really separates the diagnosis and the reality versus the acceptance? And the answer is all of us and our understanding of it. So limited socialization. Hi, how's it going? My name is Molly, it's nice to meet you. How many times have you been like, I don't even wanna get out of the door, I don't wanna to talk to another person, I don't wanna hear another person's voice. I am so incredibly over it, I just want dead silence. I know you've done it, every single one of you. A lot of you do it often, <laughs> right? We're not that different. Flat, blunted, or bizarre emotions. What's a bizarre emotion? Is it bizarre that when I say something uncomfortable, I laugh right after? I didn't know that I did that. I guess that I do it. So I guess I'll say something incredibly horrible. And the, the example that was given to me was I, they said that they thought that I made a joke about my family passing. And I said, what? And they said, yeah, the first time I met you, you know, we were talking about COVID and you said you didn't really want to talk about it because you had a poor experience. And then, you know, we, we asked a little bit more about it and you felt, you know, like you need to say something. So you did. And then right after you said, yeah, I lost my entire family in 368 days, right? The whole gambit, um, you kind of chuckled and was like, yeah, it was terrible. And then laughed and we didn't know what to do. So Think about the time where you've done that because you felt incredibly uncomfortable and you did the uncomfortable laugh, not because necessarily you were trying to be uncomfortable, but because you know that that would probably give them uncomfortable feelings even though you're okay with it. But you live in a world where people aren't okay with it because they're not comfortable with the reality of death and they're not ready to accept that it's part of reality itself, but it never quite goes away. It's only ever recycled. So, yeah, it can create those flat, blunted, or bizarre emotions that you have had that I know I've had because you guys tell me often, sorry, it just is what it is. I'm super cool and comfortable with my own skin, and that's very jarring to a lot of people, but I've known who I was the second I came onto this earth. The game has never changed in me. It's only gotten greater. It's only going to get greater. I encourage you to maybe learn a thing or two about it and do it yourself. It's quite liberating. So disorganized thinking. You're nursing students. You walk around in disorganized thinking, right? Can I do this? Am I good enough? Am I going to be able to pay my bills? God, I need to go ahead and work some extra. Hey, they're giving incentive pay for that PRN job. But you know what? I got to study for my farm because it's really hard. And that health assessment class, God, that woman just goes on for hours. I'm going to have to sit here and study like a crazy person. And she might not even talk about that question at all. Guys, don't think that I don't know how you feel. I feel how you feel. The wiring in my brain literally makes me feel the feelings that you feel. Sometimes I hear your feelings. I know it's weird. I know it sounds crazy and schizophrenic, but you got to believe me. It's a thing, and I'm incredibly successful, and I can scientifically prove it. So at that point, you got to at least, at least get a free pamphlet. And God only knows, maybe buy it for a dollar. Because you do it too. You do it too whether you know it or not. We all do it. The difference is, is I came with the instruction manual. And you guys decided that you were afraid of it, so you called it autism. Oof. That hurt. But that's the reality. I represent human evolution. I represent, hey guys, wake up. You do what I do. You think how I think. You're smart like I'm smart. You're scared like I'm scared. You're sad like I'm sad. You can do what I do. I did it and I crawled out of hell to get there. You guys, you already have more than what I had when I started. Crawl out and be a boss about it. And take over your life 
and create with your creator a coexistence that is peaceful and happy and loving and considerate and let people call you jaded for it. Do it. I don't care. Because the bottom line is, yes, I'm financially successful. Yes, I've got all the things that make a house look like it's a perfect existence. But more importantly, I've got more love in my middle finger than most people on this earth have in their entire day. And I don't even break a sweat doing it. I enjoy telling you that I'm proud of you and I love you. I enjoy laughing with you and cutting up with you. I enjoy relieving your anxiety because it relieves mine because sometimes you guys are so full of anxiety, I feel like I'm choking because I can feel it. And I understand the pressure you're going through. Okay, I support you and I care about you. And I want you guys to get where I'm at because it's cool. It's so freaking cool and you're almost there. All right? So I think I've made my point. These are the signs and symptoms of schizophrenia. Autistic thinking. Hmm. Wow. Well, y'all are learning from my brain. So you got nobody to blame but yourselves for paying attention. That's how that works. Again, delusions and hallucinations. What does that even mean? If you see a shooting star, do you not make a wish? You hallucinated the idea that that star was just for you, that that star meant something related to your creator because they communicated with you and that gave you free reign as the only person in the entire world that saw that shooting star to make a wish that your creator is then going to sprinkle fairy dust upon and give to you. Guys, we ain't that different. Ooh, and the church of whatever creator said, amen, a lady, a non-binary, because that's how that works. That's how that works. And if you want to call that quote unquote genius or quote unquote autistic, I just call it hashtag honest. All right, next slide. All right, so under the category of non-psychotic disorders is anxiety. So anxiety is something that I believe we all have within each and every one of us and it kind of comes out like you would get a common cold right and sometimes you get sick and you're sick for a hot minute and you need a little bit of extra help right so this would be um i don't know an infectious process or the idea of an infectious process just for the brain so um, when you have these episodes, what do you need? If you're infected, you need an antibiotic. If you have episodes of anxiety, what do you need? You need something that's going to be an anti-anxiolytic, right? It's just that, that simple of a concept and that, um, that typical of a situation. So um, back in the day, anxiety was even something i'm not even sure what just fell anxiety <laughs> i didn't get any anxiety off of it though um i have no idea what just fell but it's okay uh, so that was bizarre though super bizarre okay like i said you guys get me in free form i'm sorry so when we're talking about anxiety there are levels of anxiety it's all about your perception of anxiety we can maybe try to narrow down what that looks like by asking you um, a gambit of questions from statistical data that we have found get us closer to the idea of anxiety, but will we ever truly know? No, because that's what science is. Science is, I'm pretty sure, but not quite. <laughs> that is science defined as the reality of what it is to be what I am, right? I think I know an idea. I work on that idea. I might spend years on that idea and find out in the very end that it isn't an idea at all. It's not a thing. And then as a scientist, I go, well, that's phenomenal and fantastic and interesting, right? Because I am not supposed to be biased about anything. That's kind of what's fun about me is I don't judge because I, I'm not allowed to judge. It's not um, within my wiring as an individual and it most certainly isn't in my career either. So again, I am good at what I do because I am wired to do this, much like you guys are. So anxiety, fears, things of that nature, a spectrum, something that you may need some help with for a little bit and may not need again for another 10 years and then may need it for another five. It just It's just kind of there um, and flares up when it flares up. 
more importantly is the psychosomatic recovery that we can have within ourselves um, if we just simply learn how to have coping mechanisms so the idea um, of coping mechanisms is recognizing when you're having these flare-ups and retroactivating that response so from sympathetic to parasympathetic right well, we'll do this as nurses with our patients so part of understanding what it is to be a nurse is part of healing yourself I know that sounds like a lot but if you can't heal your anxiety how are you gonna tell me about mine oof that hurt good I'm glad right like it's getting real so if you're trying to fix an anxiolytic trigger that's causing a person's heart rate in the 180s you need to walk the walk before you bump your gums and talk the talk you need to fix you you need to do you and get you right and this is part of what I want to teach you so treating yourself as your own patient you need to recognize, hey, I'm having a moment of anxiety. Why? Why do I need to have this moment of anxiety? Well, I'm scared. Why are you scared? Well, because there's a boy. What about the boy? I really like the boy. All right. Well, does the boy like you? I don't know. Okay. Well, why not? Well, because I don't know how to recognize it. Okay. Well, what are you going to do about it? I don't know. I'm going to sit here and freak out because they're on the way to come hang out. And I'm not ready, <laughs> right? And then that's the part where you go, all right, this is stupid. Are you validated as an individual? Yeah, you are. Are you worthy? Yeah, you are. Are you a fly cook? Yes, you are. Are you smart? Yup. Are you funny? I think so. Are you kind? More than most. Is it gonna be okay? Well, you know what, if it's not, sucks to be them <laughs> not my problem right and then we go from sympathetic to parasympathetic so I encourage you guys to fix your anxiety there's a lot of anxiety in these rooms sometimes it chokes me physically I feel like I can't talk I get so gassed out from your energy sometimes that by the end of the class I'm like all right there's 30 minutes left let's just do our questions or let's just do an activity where we can get caught up on our other things, right? Because that's a legal move. But the reality is, is I'm so, um, I'm like a sponge. And you guys are like, ooh, that feels good. I'm going to stand next to that. Because if I stand next to that, I feel better, right? And that's what you and I are. We're this dynamic where I receive all of your input and information that you're trying to dust off and get rid of. And then I eat it like Pac-Man, and finally I get so big, I need to take a break and breathe, right? We all do it. You do it with your kids. You do it with family that won't leave you alone, right? We all have a degree of what that looks like. I'm just different because I'm wired different, so I receive it differently, right? So that's kind of what that looks like. Anxiety, fixing the trigger, fixing the trigger within yourself, and then fixing the trigger within your patient because you then have graduated the idea of understanding anxiety to a level to where you're able to teach it from a first person perspective and that's the best perspective to teach it in all right next slide so again four levels of anxiety have been described we describe it because we have to put things in boxes the problem with boxes again is when we box things in we separate them we give it one extra layer and microcosm of difference, of segregation, which is the dumbest thing we need to do considering we all share the same lifeblood. <laughs> it's so stupid. I don't understand it, but whatever. I'll keep boxing things in so long as you guys keep telling me to teach it that way. Cool. So mild, moderate, severe, panic. Great. The problem with these boxes is, is the boxes need to catch the ball when I throw it in the direction I believe it should go into because mild might be your panic, right? Four levels of anxiety, all right? I walk in the door and I am uh, on the elevator and as soon as the elevator pops open, I see someone rolling by, bleeding, blood all on the floor, gunshot victim, and I've got the nurse looking at me going, oh my God, I've been waiting at the elevator, I know you come early. To me, that's like, ugh. 
All right, cool. What are we doing? What's going on? Talk to me. That would be my considering mild. That would be panic for most of you guys. But in the day in the life of a veteran nurse that's ICU on a trauma unit that day, it was like, all right, well, next time I need to come 20 minutes early, right? By the way, they lived. So, um, again, why do we have boxes when the boxes create spectrum and the spectrum is a bobbing and weaving movable target? Do they all just shift in degrees? Are we playing Pong now? Like, what are we doing? What, what, what's the point of all of this? It's so stupid. We need to compartmentalize things because at that point we can justify its meaning and our, our validation for saying that that's the meaning. But in putting boxes together, we create a caveat where things have to shift and move and mold and then we have to create more boxes until we find out that there's no such thing as a box to begin with, right? It's some conceptualization in your mind, which is the definition of schizophrenia, right? A paranoid delusion. It's just all so stupid, this world. It's just so silly the way that we require things to be. And yet it matters not, and it never has. So how about that for anxiety? All right, next slide. Again, here are examples of moderate anxiety, severe anxiety, and what the idea of panic is gonna be. However, this is not mutually exclusive with reality. This is mutually exclusive with your reality, okay? Unable to think logically or make decisions. All right, cool. When was the last time I did that? Huh. The last time I did that was when my dad died. Yeah. When my dad died. I remember I forgot to eat for a couple of days. And when someone addressed it and said, Molly, you haven't eaten in a couple of days, I thought to myself, the first thought that I re remember thinking was, well, do I even think I need to eat food right now? Right? Because it was such an illogical, irrational moment in my life because I had just lost my best friend. Like he was literally my best friend. So what do you do with that? What do, you, what do you do with that? So yeah, yeah, it's, it's been a minute, but I, I understand severe, but here's the thing, I didn't feel panic. I felt lost, right? So again, spectrum, spectrum. It's just different. All right, next slide. All right, so obsessive compulsive disorder. Again, this one has very small nuances and then there are very large ones and when we come into an area of disruption of the body system and ability to function as they believe it, that is when we clearly define this as a, a true obsessive compulsive disorder. People say they are obsess obsessive compulsive, but when you are truly obsessive compulsive, sorry, that's not a student, so I'm just gonna get rid of it. When you're truly obsessive compulsive, um, your obsession and compulsion goes beyond the realm of, okay, that's fine. There were only six taps and I require things in sevens. So a lot of people who are on autism spectrum have a version of obsessive compulsive disorder. So I, ever since I was, I don't know, five, six, maybe have had a thing for numbers, right? Ooh, Wow, what a crazy idea. The person with autism spectrum has a thing for numbers. No, I mean, I have to do things in numbers, right? I don't order things in two, I order them in three. Um, I, I, when you go to the bathroom and you have to hit the paper towel holder, you know, the, to pump it, to make it go down, um, I, I've had to do it in sevens since the day I can remember. Um, if it's a six, I, something has got to create a seven, period. So there's a difference between that and I want everything to be in order and I'm going to clean it very tidily, um, but my soups aren't going to be in alphabetical order and the labels aren't going to be facing forward. That's the difference between, 
you know, one idea and the other. Or I am a germaphobe. So my father, he was, it's funny, the more I think about this, the more I'm like, hmm, did I really get this from my mother? Because traditionally autism spectrum is, is from the mother. Um, however, the more I talk about my dad, the more I'm just like, whoa, this is weird. So my dad wouldn't touch money. Like my dad literally wouldn't touch money unless he had the ability to wash his hands with like soap, water, and orange goop. Like I, this isn't even a joke. My dad would carry it with him, much like a man would carry his wallet. And if he had to exchange money in any form, first off, he never touched a $20 bill in his entire life because most indigenous don't because Jackson is on the $20 bill. Not cool. That's the Muskogee Creek thing. We don't do it. It's not a thing. Um, also, like uh, coin money, right? He wouldn't touch certain type of coin money because it didn't sound good. See, there it goes again. That's another trait. So he would, uh, again, obsessive to the point to where if he had a day where he had to work at the flea market because he used to sell things, he used to make things, he would wash his hands so much that they would bleed. That is true obsessive compulsive disorder versus, oh, my notebook isn't straight because I got three notebooks, so I'm combining them into one. Unless I start color coding it and unless I don't like the pages being slightly yellow, which is why I changed my notebook in the first place. And you know who you are. And we joked about it and laughed. And I'm going to leave that one for you to laugh at for later. That is the difference between a fair obsession or a fair compulsion, but not true obsessive compulsive disorder. All right, next slide. So acute stress disorder. This is a good slide. All right. Occurs with first month of exposure to extreme trauma right combat physical assault near death experience witnessing a murder accidentally killing somebody um acute stress syndrome so you are in a period of complete mental debilitation for a hot minute but it's not forever post-traumatic stress disorder all right you guys know that i have like a pet peeve with post-traumatic stress disorder because a lot of people misuse it um, and then we, when we misuse things, it's not that someone's misusing it and that's why I'm angry because I'm not invalidating your level of trauma in your brain. The thing that irritates me is, uh, so like with the autism spectrum, right? It became this cool thing for a minute. And I don't know what that was about or why we decided that it was cute to have autism spectrum because there's nothing cute about not being able to get around certain people because their energy is so hot. I can't stand it. Like there's nothing cute about smelling someone about to die because I can smell it down the hallway because I don't know why nobody else I know does it right. It's not cute to literally know what you're thinking because at that point it's unworldly and I'm tapping into something that's very private, right? Like I, I literally can call you guys and clock you guys to a T it's not because I'm clever. It's because I can feel it. I literally have a cheat code. So I don't feel like any of those things are something to celebrate about or be funny about, right? There was this TikTok thing where people were pretending to be autistic, um, but they were somehow mixing it with Tourette's. And I'm like, why are you, that's not a STEM. You don't have Tourette's moments as a STEM. I've never even heard of that. I mean, maybe there's a, a isolated case, but for the love of God, no. I STEM, you guys just don't know I'm STEMing, but I do. And it's pretty obvious. I constantly got to be in motion, duh. That's my form of stemming. I can't sit still. And if I do, then I have a true stem and I don't like it because it's unsightly and it's weird, right? It's not like shaking back and forth, but I do something with my thumb and my forefinger and people notice it and they ask me what it's about and it just makes it uncomfortable for me. But the bottom line is, is there's, there's something, right? So please understand what that is looks like um generalized anxiety versus post-traumatic stress completely <laughs> different generalized anxiety is i'm afraid about taking a test post-traumatic stress related to a test is stress where you felt so mortified from that examination that any other examination in comparison or the thought of an examination or the mere sight of A, B, C, and D next to each other in such a form reminds you of an examination which causes such delayed stress 
in response that you physically shake. That is post-traumatic stress disorder. There's a big difference. When we make things like autism spectrum and it becomes cute, and then we start calling everybody autism spectrum, my autism's kicking in, I'm having an autistic moment. These are things that I hear people say and I go, do you even know what that's like to be bitten by the spider and then to feel all of the feelings until you turn into Spider-Man? Like, I don't wanna hear that. Come on, that's not how that works. It's painful, it, it's painful. Some days it's painful, most days it's painful, right? So big difference. And that's why post-traumatic stress disorder, we shouldn't be misusing it either because true post-traumatic stress disorder is very serious, extremely serious, all right? So continues for more than one month. Functional impairment. Functional impairment means I am so shaken by this event and I have become so mentally shook that I cannot physically speak. I cannot physically speak or I feel like I'm gonna break in half and have a meltdown in front of all of these people. Big difference. Generalized anxiety, a little bit different. Acute stress, a little bit different, okay? It's chronic. It's chronic. And along with it comes feelings of, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough. And then bouts of trying to validate yourself by doing things to the extreme. Like, you know, achieving multiple degrees at the same time in some of the toughest universities the nation has. Just to validate that you can do it because you do mean something and you're gonna mean something to a lot of people, right? That's the difference, big difference, big difference. All right, next slide. All right, so alcohol withdrawal syndrome, also a terrible thing to watch. You have the ability to get rid of this person's withdrawal symptoms. If you have a problem or microaggression with alcoholics, you need to let it go right now. You need to start working on it right now because it feels like a thousand ants are biting you all at one time when you're withdrawing from alcohol and you are an alcoholic. You shake, you vomit, you sweat. Things come out of both ends of things where you could expel things. How about that? You feel like you're going to be sick and you dry heave and you can't eat. And my daughter just burped very loudly. So I apologize if you heard that. And you are angry and you see things and you hear things and your head swells and it feels worse than any hangover you've ever experienced. And you've got cold chills everywhere. And then all of a sudden it gets hot, like super duper hot to the point where you got to put ice on you, but then you get an even worse of a headache. Like, I think I'm making my point here. It's a big deal. You should never, ever make someone suffer like that. Because think about it. Why did they drink in the first place? I mean, they didn't drink because their life was so great. They thought, hey, I'm just going to get buzzed on top of it. I mean, I guess some do but not to the point of alcoholism. They usually do it because something quite terrible happens to them. So if something quite terrible is happening to them and your options are drink to get drunk and not have to feel or feel all the feelings that you have to feel, what are you gonna choose? What are you gonna choose? Make this about you. Most nurses don't understand patients and they get pissy with patients and they get really, really angry with the way that they are. But they don't truly understand what it took for them to become who they truly became in that moment and what they need in order to get out of that moment because they don't know how to crawl out of hell on their own. So you can continue to kick them down back into the hole or you can stick your arm out and try to pick them up. What are you gonna do? And remember, your creator is watching you, whoever that is. So I got nothing to do with it. Right? Just the fact alone that it's outside of my moral compass is enough for me. But just remember, when you have that moment of integrity that you need to keep and nobody is watching you, and you have the ability to walk away 
and still achieve the greatness that is your moral compass as far as society is concerned, what are you going to do? Because most people would just walk because I've seen it. Don't be that person, right? They're not inherently bad people. They can actually be great people, amazing people. People probably miss them. Try to bring that back in them. If there are enough people that do that, they might start to believe it. One nurse won't be enough, but if we create a dynamic where this becomes the way we think of nursing, then it does. It does become enough because there will be enough to follow. All right, next slide. All right, again, alcohol withdrawal syndrome, we're concerned with seizures. We're concerned with symptoms that go so bad that they have cardiac dysrhythmias, right? Um, alcoholics are notorious for having PACs. Usually not a big deal, can become a big deal, can become something bigger. And again, part of alcohol withdrawal syndrome is losing a lot of your vitamins that your body needs to supply itself with nutrient. Um, so there's going to be a lot of deficiencies associated with this. Now, mild to moderate, here's your symptoms. Severe, again, here are your symptoms. They are going to be confused and hallucinate. They are um, potentially going to get so bad that they go throwing punches. Again, tachycardic, worsening hypertension. My kid just clocked the back of her head and didn't even cry about it, right? She, she may have what I have. Are you okay? We're okay. All right, moving on. So know the difference between mild to moderate, no severe. Know that our withdrawal threshold is usually 72 hours. Third day is usually the worst. We've talked about that in class, um, although there are variances. And we need to do what's called a CEWA scale. Um, that's going to rate how much Ativan we need to give our patient, um, either intravenously, depending on how bad it is, or orally, um, if they're able to swallow and we know they're not going to choke or anything. Next slide. All right. Substance abuse disorders, drug intoxication. Commonly abused drugs include marijuana, cocaine, opiates, barbiturates, amphetamines, hallucinogenic agents. There are others, by the way. Um, some of these are sublingual variants. Some of these include K2 derivatives. There's some other stuff going around right now. At one point, Gator uh, was a thing, but it wasn't commonly used, thank God, because that was a big fat mess. Or Crocodile. It wasn't Gator. It was Crocodile. It was Crocodile. Crocodile. I don't know why I called it Gator. Crocodile. All right. So, substance abuse disorders, that's what that looks like. Next slide. All right, so now we're going to talk about cognitive disorders such as delirium. Delirium, uh, we see it in hospitals with certain patients. Um, I've seen it in young patients and old patients. I don't think it really matters depending on the situation. Um, it's reversible with treatment. It usually involves a uh, course of medications, antibiotic therapy, yada, yada, yada. Uh, clinical findings, altered level of consciousness, impaired memory, fluctuating attention span, sundowning, Speech is rapid, inappropriate. They get really, really ticky. Hallucinations or delusions. Um, UTIs create this in the elderly. Uh, there are other um, episodes of delirium, uh, which include traumatic, bra or tra traumatic brain injury. Somehow that became traumatic brad injury, whatever. Um, noxious brain injuries, uh, alcohol abuse injuries, things of that nature. Next slide. Now, in dementia, it's completely different from delirium, right? So dementia is a, a full-on memory impairment. Uh, oh, I'd like for you to look those words up. Aphasia, apraxia, agnosia. Look those three up. That'll be fun. Um, you're going to need to know them anyways. Uh, dementia is not reversible. Dementia, more than likely, is progressive. Dementia can be slowed based off of medications, but it is, um, it's progressive. Next slide. Again, I love to give opportunities for extra credit. So here's your question. During the initial intake, the nurse asked the patient a series of questions. When asked how long he has been working on real estate, the patient responds by saying, I think five years. My dad was in real estate, but my mom worked in an office. I like offices because they are usually organized and neat. My son is very messy, but he is 
good at guitar. Do you play any musical instruments? Then there should document that the patient, A, B, C, or D. And I can already tell you which one that one is because that one's pretty obvious. All right, next slide. All right, next question. A 58-year-old retired police officer is being a admitted for hip replacement surgery during the health assessment he admits to consuming six beers each night to help him fall asleep which of the following is the most appropriate action for the nurse to take um this is usually when i make a really bad joke that always just multiply by two um that's a nursing joke because uh, the classic patient says that they have two beers but usually it's more like four or five but it wasn't meant to be a funny haha -ha joke. Uh, well, it was, but I think I failed. So that is your scenario. A, B, C, or D are your options. Um, this concludes your mental health section. I am now going to be working on, dare I say, neurology, which is going to be 96 slides. Jeez, my knees, Louise. All right, so I'm going to try to keep it short and sweet. And I will see you guys on Monday while I spend all weekend doing these.